Uh, this morning, God has led me to a very familiar book of the Bible. Uh, it's a book called Haggai. Everybody familiar with that? Yeah. 791 in your uh, Bibles in your chair rack. Otherwise, you should be able to find it. It's one of the minor prophets. Don't get scared by that, right? A couple things you should know about this book. One, it's short, right? Anybody appreciate brevity? I appreciate brevity. It's short. I'm short. Uh, anyway, it's short. And then uh, it's very simple and straightforward. It's not one of those minor prophets that you read and be like, I do not know what was just said, <laughs> right? It's very direct. It's very clear. It's very simple. And I am always stunned by how real God's word is today. And here's why. We're going to read a book that was written thousands of years ago to people who lived thousands of years ago in a very different situation than ours. But you know what's unchanged? God is unchanged and people are unchanged, right? They couldn't have even imagined indoor plumbing, but they have all the same problems we have, the same challenges, the same weaknesses, the same, the same good thing. Like, People are people are people, and that's one of the reasons God's word is timeless. So what God has to say to these people is something that he has to say to us this morning. So don't click off and go, it's a weird book. I barely could find it. I probably won't understand what's going to be said. I'm telling you, if you just read this and you understand a tiny bit about the story that's happening, it will connect to where you live, right? Haggai, hopefully you found it by now. Everybody found it? Anybody still lost? Have to check. All right, here we go. Haggai, we're going to read the first seven verses and then we're going to pray. In the second year of Darius the king, he was a king in Persia, one of the world powers of that day. In the sixth month, on the first day of the month. By the way, if the Bible was a fraud of fairy tales, why would it be so specific about people and places and days and events? The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Don't get hung up. He's the civil leader. And to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. He's the religious leader. Thus says the Lord of hosts. There's no doubt in the book of Haggai that God is the one speaking. By the way, every time we open our Bibles, God is the one speaking. It, it, this, this already said twice. The word of the Lord came and thus says the Lord. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Here's what God says. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, God's house, lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. That's what my bank account feels like right now. Anybody else feel like that? Yeah, it's like in all the holes go to the grocery store. Or, I don't know. Verse 7, the gas station, yeah. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for its timelessness, its truth. You are the everlasting God. You had no beginning. You will have no end. Our, our little finite brains can't even begin to, to comprehend that. But you have been our dwelling place for all ages. We sit in awe of your greatness. We sang of it this morning because it is truly amazing to behold you in your glory and we have such a small glimpse of it. We see darkly. We see like through a veil. But you are great and glorious. Your word is all powerful. It is what our hearts need. So please transform us by it. Help us to look into the mirror of your word today and to go away different not the same. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every once in a while I get asked by someone who doesn't know me very well if my dad was a pastor. Now, and I don't know why that is exactly, but there's kind of like this assumption that maybe it like goes through the genetics or something, 
Or maybe people are like, how does anyone end up in that career? <laughs> you know, maybe you grew up in a family like that. Um, both my parents came to know Jesus as like 20-somethings. And my dad was studying to be a pharmacist, has been a pharmacist his whole life, and uh, just retired a couple of years ago. But my dad would run nursing home pharmacies. That made for a fascinating childhood, uh, because even as, uh, you know, like Caleb Adam, who's here. How old are you, Caleb? Dad's talking to him. How old's Caleb? Nine? Ten? Nine. Okay, got it. All right, so even at Caleb's age, when there was a run to a nursing home that was kind of after hours or something to deliver medicine, uh, oftentimes my dad would take me around. So if you've ever been in a nursing home, they smell interesting. You get interesting experiences with interesting people, right? But that was, what, that was the world I grew up around, so it wasn't abnormal to me. I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is uh, where old people live at some point in their lives, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that was what my dad did. And occasionally, um, their pharmacy would have to do inventory. Anybody participate in an inventory at a workplace anywhere? That's like the funnest day of the year, isn't it? No, <laughs> that's right, right? But as a, as a teenager, I thought it was great because we got to go in after hours. I think my dad's company hired me because nobody else wanted to work inventory. So they hired myself and my brother, and we would go in and we would help them count everything in the pharmacy. So no kidding, we would like dump out pills onto the table and you, there's a little pill sorter if you've ever been to pharmacy. Wait, 100, 112, 112, we count. And then anybody know those uh, inventory tags, those yellow tags that you like stick in to verify that you've counted, right? Like, so if you're counting a whole store, that's, that's how you inventory it. Why do you do inventory? It's not because everybody wants to. We loved it because we got late night pizza. We got paid to do it. And then sometimes we would like fall asleep in the office while it finished up and we would go home the next morning. It was just a cool experience as a teenager. We were probably weird. But anyway, we got this opportunity. Why do you do inventory? to make sure things aren't missing. Because in the run of doing everything, we can get a little bit lost. You, you do inventory at a pharmacy to make sure nobody's taking medicine, right? But we need God's help to do inventory on ourselves. Because if not, we get so busy with the things of life that we don't check on the condition of our heart. We don't, we don't check on the order of things. And it's our tendency as sinful, weak human beings to get things out of order because we're pushed and pulled, we're running and we're going. And before we know it, things get out of whack from where they should be. When we turn to Haggai, God says something twice. Did you notice it? He says this, consider your Ways. You know what he's saying? Take inventory on yourself. Check where your life is headed. Check what you're choosing to place the priority on because it can get out of order. And I think this is actually a great time of year for us to do this. We have a lot of young families. I said summer's wrapping up. School year's around the corner. Some of you retirees, you're planning travel schedules and all this. I think it's actually a really good moment in the year to step back and say, where, is, where has my life been? And where is it going? And in all that, how do I make choices that honor God? The reason that the book of Haggai is written is because these people got their priorities out of whack. Go back to Ezra. I want to show you this real quick. The book of Ezra. We're staying in the very familiar books of the Bible today. Turn to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. If you find Psalms, you're close. Ezra chapter 4. I want to give you a tiny bit of backstory. I know some of you can't stand history. It's going to be okay, and it, I won't make it long, and I'll try to make it interesting. But it will help you understand the situation that Haggai's written in. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, you're like, oh, this will be long. I'm telling you it won't. You go all the way back to the book of Genesis. The nation of Israel is started when God calls who? Abram, Abraham. And he says, I'm going to start a nation with you. And he did that because Abraham was amazing and powerful and strong and financially set, right? 
No, he did that. He started small. And he picked somebody insignificant. And even though we hold up Abraham as a man of faith, did Abraham get it all right? Dude, he had some mess ups bad. Twice he moved to a foreign country. He was so afraid that the ruler would want to take his wife from him that he lied and said she was just his sister. Twice. And it made a mess. And the whole rest of the story of God's people Israel is like all these ups and downs. And there are bright moments of hope and there are moments of faith. And like we, we tell all the kids about how David defeated Goliath. And we're like, woohoo! And it's great. And then David crashes and burns. And then we're like, Solomon, that guy was amazingly wise. And God, God grows the nation of Israel under Solomon's leadership. And they build these amazing structures and they have peace. And then Solomon just takes it off the rails. It's all these ups and downs along the way. But God had warned his people that if they followed him, it would be well with them. But if they went their own way and chased the idols that were all around them and and did what was right in their own eyes like the book of Judges, then God would ultimately do what? He would send them out of the land that he had given them. He would send them into captivity. And that happened. It happened in about 700 B.C., for the northern kingdom of Israel. It happened in 600 BC for the southern kingdom, okay? They end up gone for about 70 years, the southern kingdom. They go to a place called Babylon. But God said he would bring them home. Don't you love coming home? I mean, I love going on vacation, but I love coming home. Hotel beds are nice. My bed is better, right? Restaurants are great. Colleen's cooking is better. She's not here, but tell her I said that, okay? (laughs) And God brings them home. And when they get home, they have some projects to do because their city has been destroyed. God's house, the temple has been leveled. Stone after stone torn apart. It's just in ruins, which is what some of your houses look like when you come home from vacation. (laughs) It's in ruins. So they come home. And immediately they set up on a building project. God uses Nehemiah, and in less than two months, they rebuild the whole wall. They have safety and security, their home. And then under Ezra, they start to rebuild God's house. And so the Bible tells us that they lay the foundation, they rebuild the altar so they can have sacrifices, but they begin to face opposition. Look at the end of Ezra chapter 4, verse 23. They faced opposition from their neighbors. They faced opposition from worldwide powers. And verse 23 says this, Then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem, and by force and power they made them cease. They made them cease what? Building God's house. They made them stop. Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Turn the page, chapter 5, verse 1. Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, there's our guy, the son of Idu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Jerusalem, Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, we just read about, and Joshua, the son of Jozadak that we just read about, arose and began to rebuild the house of God. Here's the thing we miss, okay? How long is there between verse 24 of chapter (laughs) 4 and chapter 5, verse 1. How long does it feel? Feels quick. We've got our building edition in permit right now. And we had estimated when we started the project that it would take between two and four weeks to go through permit. We found out it's between two and three months. Awesome. It's a delay. This is buildings, right? Buildings get delayed. This is not a two or three month delay. Do you know how long goes between the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five? Around 15 years. So for 15 years, God's people come back into Jerusalem at least three times a year to worship him. And what what does the temple look like? Not much. They did the basics, they faced some pressure, and the work stalled. So go back to Haggai 1. 
This is your practice. Now you will have found it twice. Be ready for your next sword drill. So God patiently waits for years and years and years. And then verse two, he shows up and he says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So God starts with a call to consider, a call to think, a call to examine what's happening all around these people. He starts with their leaders. Verse one tells us that he came to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor. He came to Joshua. His call started with his leaders. Now I'm thankful for leadership, but you know there's a responsibility to it. I'm thankful for the pastors and deacons here at Gospel Hope. Do you know there's a weight to that? God starts with people who are leading and he says, hey, I need to talk to you about something. I'm thankful for all our dads. You know what, dads? You have a responsibility. A responsibility to lead. A responsibility to direct. A responsibility to see when things are going well and when they're not. You have a job to do. And you're, we're not supposed to. We do this a lot, but we're not supposed to pass that weight off. We're supposed to carry it. But God's call includes everyone. All the people are saying something while God's project remains undone. And they're saying this, it's not a good time to do this. We'll do it later. Ha! Welcome home. This is where we all live. Our kids are going back to school. They're going to get their projects to do. And guess what they're going to do? The same things you and I did in school. You know what we did? We got our assignments, right? Think about Ben and Webb over there. Yes, I said your names. They were ducking. They're going back. I'm thinking about Asa and Ian. They get their project, and they're like, oh, I have an English paper due in a month. I should start that now. Right? <laughs> they don't. But this is not just an issue with children, is it? We all tend to be sucked in by the delay of time. So can't you imagine that when the people of Israel came down to Jerusalem for their festivals and for their, like to worship God, they probably went to each other, we really need to get this temple thing done. But you know what? This year's really not a good time. You know when we should do this? We should do this next year. We should do this at a more convenient time. Why? Oh man, you don't understand. Our fields, they need a lot of attention this year. I mean, my house, that storm that came through last year, it ripped up the roof, and I'm going to be so busy with that roof. I got to get it done. Man, you don't understand our kids. They're just at this stage of life that they require all this time, and, and this year's not a good year. We'll do it next year. Now's not a good time. And before they know it, it's not next year that the project doesn't get done. It's not the year after. It's not the year after, it's how long? 15 years. And God says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You all say it's not a good time. How many of you lead some sort of organization? Or you, you, you have a responsibility to, to like get other people involved in something? How many of you, you, you lead in a business setting? You lead in a nonprofit setting. You lead in a volunteer. How many of you do this? Raise your hands. I gotta wake you up. Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have heard someone say, I would love to help you with that. It's just not a good time. How many of you have said that yourself? My hand's in the air. And here's the trap that we fall into. When we say, I'll do it next year. I'll do it at a better time it makes us feel better about how important it is to us. Let me give you an example. Where's Josh? Usually I pick on my family and tell you personal stories, but I'll tell a Josh story. Josh and I are gonna try to help each other get in better shape. Not round shape, less shape. 
We need to do it, fair? Yeah, you all know it. I don't have to tell you that. You're my friends. You, you see, you're not blind. A foot taller. Get on that stretching board tomorrow. And so at town days, Josh came in contact with a gym owner in town. And they're doing this interesting thing, and so we made an appointment to check it out. So we went. This was what, about a week and a half ago, Josh? Yeah, we went to see the gym. <laughs> and we were there. And they walked us around, and we saw all the equipment, and they pitched us on how much it was a month, which was crazy. Right? I was like, no way. But I walked out, and you know what I felt? Better. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's true. Why did I feel better? Because I intended to take a step that I knew I needed to take. And I could say, it's important to me. We'll get that gym thing figured out. But can I ask you something? How much did I actually do? Nada. Josh bought the shakes. I saw them in your garage. <laughs> Maybe he started. I don't even know. We haven't talked. Maybe he's ahead of me. And I'm throwing him under the bus with me. But this is our human nature to think good of our good intentions. But God has something to say. Do you see what he says? You say it's not yet time to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, and God asks a convicting question. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins. Now that word paneled may mean that they had extravagant houses, but what I think it means, what most commentators agree, is that it means that these people were living in houses with roofs. They had taken care of their own shelter, and they had left God's project partially done, barely started, bare minimum. We'll get to it later. And here's what we think, guys. Here's what I think. Man, if I just had more resources, if my life was just in a better place, then I would prioritize what God wants me to do. But I have some things that have to get done. Am I just talking to myself here or are there some of you who are tracking with me? And we sang... <laughs> And it was powerful. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. Wasn't that powerful? You know where the, the rubber meets the road? Whether my life tomorrow, whether my life this afternoon looks like, behold my God, seated on his throne. My life is about him. And we can sing it on Sunday and leave it in an hour. Can't we? Because our time and our resources are not the problem. But we say things like, it's not a good time to commit to an opportunity to serve. It's not a good time to invite our neighbors over for dinner. It's summer, it's a gazillion degrees. I'll have them over once fall happens. Then, then we'll get to know our neighbors better and we'll talk to them about Jesus. That, that, that'll, we'll do that later. It's not a good time to get up early and spend time with God. I had a late night last night. We went to a movie, it was awesome, but I just can't get up tomorrow morning. So can I ask you something? Is next week actually a good time? What about next month? What about next year? That's how we get to 16 years. One week, one month, one year at a time. And we all do it. And God asks, is it a good time? Like he says this, you have time for work, but not for my work. 
You have time for your family, but not for my family. You have time for your relationships, but not a relationship with me. You have plenty of time to talk, but not to talk with me. And this is the one that convicts my heart deeply. We have time to serve our own interests, but not his interests. I like to golf. And for some reason, a 6.30 a.m. tea time sounds rational to me. Because I can start my day and the weather's cool before we all get, live on the surface of the sun. And I can get up. But you know how hard it is to get up? Just open my Bible, spend 15 minutes with God, spend 30 minutes with God. See how our priorities leak? We got a national parks puzzle on our trip to Grand Tetons. And I don't know what it is about human nature, but I'm just like, I gotta get that thing done. And I'll stay up late and I'll get up early and I'll find that piece I'm missing. Like, we just, we just get sucked into these things, don't we? And God is like, ha, ah, 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 over here. And if we're not careful, God who calls for our first and our best gets our last and our least. Well, I'll give to God if I have any money left over at the end of the month. Well, I'll serve if there's space in my schedule with everything else going on. Well, I'll get to know my neighbors when there's a better connection. And then we've been in our neighborhood for we, we just crossed three years. We've had plenty of time. And some of you are way ahead of us. And so God calls us to carefully consider our ways. I was meditating on the thought this week that the simplest commandment God gave his people was the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. You know what I say? Of course. I believe in Jesus. You're the one true God. God the Father, God the Son, God, I, I believe the Bible. But man, I walk out into my life and all the other gods of this life are yelling for me. And I'm going, golf? Sounds good. Overtime? I can do that. Family event? I'm in. God, God almost there, almost there. I just need a little more time. And when God's priorities are neglected, nothing else actually works. Look at verse six. Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. We live in a culture of Christianity that has more and more and more and more, and we have less and less and less and less. I'm telling you, I sit in youth group with our teenagers who have a $700 phone. Their, their parents, this is probably not $700. They have a, they have a hand-me-down $100 phone right? Whatever their parents got them. They have all the transportation they could need. They have a job. They have clothing. They have shelter. And they're going, I'm depressed. My life is empty. And do you know where they're learning that, guys? Welcome to all of us. And God won't let us stay in that place. He will resist it. Because he tells us in Matthew 6 that when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all the other stuff gets added. Look at God's resistance, verse 7. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Fascinatingly, guess what the people of Israel came back to Jerusalem with plenty of? when God sent them out of Babylon. Wood for a roof. But God says go up in the hills and get wood because it was gone. 
So how'd that happen? Well, either they neglected it or they took care of their own roofs. Don't we do the same thing? Ha- have you ever had um, like an extra amount of money come in and you were like, I should give a good chunk of that to the Lord, but you didn't do it right away? And then stuff started to happen and you had need come up and there was a car thing and there was a, and all of a sudden you look at your bank account and you're like, where'd it go? You ever look at your week and go, man, I got a bunch of time this week. I should jump in in this way, but you don't do it. And then everything fills in and it's gone. God says, go take care of my priorities. Look at verse nine. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. I feel like that's one of the most powerful phrases in this whole chapter. God was like, great, you brought that home, whoosh, I blew it away. Listen, listen. Some of our lives aren't working at all because there are legitimate trials that we have no control over. But some of our lives aren't working at all because God is resisting us. Jade read James chapter, this isn't just an Old Testament idea. James chapter four says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. When my son wants to do something dumb and go his own way, part of my job as dad is to stand in his way. And you know God graciously, kindly stands in our way? Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, he says, that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. They were plenty busy, but not about what mattered to God. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and on beasts and on all their labors. Do you know that historically there are two ways that God sends judgment on people or he resists them? By national overthrow, but ultimately the country's so weak it's easy, and by natural disaster. That's historically always been true. Now we, we in our finite minds can't always connect the dots of how all those things are working. But make no mistake, God loves you too much to keep running with your own priorities and putting his at the end of the list. Look at the response, verse 12. So there's a kind resistance, but there's a quick correction. Verse 12, then Zerubbabel and Joshua with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. Listen to God's new message. I am with you, declares the Lord. Do you know most of the time when prophets came to people and shared God's word with them, it wasn't met very well? I mean, Isaiah had years and years and years of ministry and people were like, whatever. Jeremiah ends up thrown in a pit. We call him the weeping prophet because it did not go well. Do you know this is a great story? God confronts his people and they respond. In fact, we believe historically that this this, uh, message came to God's people on August the 29th of 520 BC. We think we can get about that specific. So it's August. We're not quite there, but we're close. Do you know when the people got back to work? September the 23rd. Three weeks. Sometimes we think because we've been in a bad pattern for a long time, it's gonna take a long time to fix. Do you know most of the things that God wants us to take a step forward and we could probably take today or tomorrow? You say, well, I think God wants me to do something significant. Well, you could probably do that in a month. You know, you could sell your home in a month probably. You get a new job. Say, no, month or two. You could sign up for something today. You could have a conversation with your spouse that needs to be had and start the path forward. You could invite your neighbors over for dinner this week. They might say no. That's okay. See if they're available next week. 
when God walks into our world, he's saying to us, consider your ways. You know what the great promise of the gospel is? That when you know Christ as your savior, Hebrews 13 says this, he's with you wherever you go. You're never going anywhere without God. But you know that God can withdraw his hand of care and blessing in our lives. And he doesn't do that vindictively. He does that to get our attention and to get us back on his track to discipline us like a father, Hebrews 12 tells us, and to get our priorities lined up with his. I don't have time to develop this, but can I just tell you what it meant to these people that God would be with them? You can read chapter two and you'll see this. It meant that they would experience God's glory. Do you know they they were building the second house for God and it was nothing compared to Solomon's house that he had built. It was pretty lame comparatively. It was pretty small. But you know what God said? The glory in this house will exceed what Solomon built. And do you know why he said that? Because who would be carried into that house one day as a baby? The house that these guys were building. Who would go there as a 12-year-old and and reason with the religious authorities of his day? Who would go in there and teach on prayer and giving and fasting? Who would go there and one day stand before the rulers of his day to die on the cross for us? That's glory. And God took the work of these people's hands and he did something glorious. Do you want that? Read Psalm 90 today. God is everlasting, you are not. Would he make our work glorious? glorious. It also meant that they would know God's peace. Look at verse 8 of chapter 2. I will give you peace, declares the Lord. And they would know his grace, even though they had issues. You'll see in the rest of chapter 2. Ephesians 5 verse 15 says it this way. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of time because the days are evil. You know what the best use of time is? Get busy about God's work. Figure out what God's projects are and jump on that train. By the way, those projects don't all just happen here. They happen as you faithfully are a mom in your home. They happen as you love and serve your neighbors. They happen in our community. They happen all over the place. But some of us have gotten to the place where our projects, they're first. And God has fallen down the rungs. I know I see that in my own life. Do you? Let's pray together. God, thank you for calling us to take inventory, to consider our ways. Help us not to just rush through life doing whatever has the most pressure at the moment or whatever seems most urgent But God, help us to make your work, your projects, your priorities, our time with you, our time with your people, our time in relationships, our time sharing Jesus. Help your greatness and your glory to transfer into how we live this afternoon and tomorrow and the day after that. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.